The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. We have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services to companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I'm the author of many books on software testing, as well as being the past president of the ISTQB and the ASTQB. Attendance at today's webinar earns PMI PDUs. Thank you, Jim Romans, for reviewing the material for PDU status. If you have questions, any questions, during the course of the webinar, you may submit them throughout the presentation via your webinar interface, but please note that they are answered only at the end. Hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. If you enjoy our free webinars and feel that they demonstrate solid insights into the kinds of testing challenges you face, please make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. We're happy to provide a quote for any such help you might need. Contact us at info at rbcs-us.com. Today's presentation is on the intersection between psychology and politics when you're managing testing and trying to avoid going crazy and ending up in a place like this, which is the McLean Hospital for the Mentally Ill or whatever the official name is in uh, I think it's in Massachusetts somewhere. It's a uh, number of very famous um, uh, people so, <laughs> spent time there. Uh, Sylvia Platt, I believe, was there. Uh, David Foster Wallace uh, was there. Uh, things didn't turn out well for either of those folks, as you might uh, know. So um, I'm hopefully going to give you some ideas that will help you avoid ending up uh, uh, in a place like this or with a fate like theirs. So what's this all about anyway? I mean, aren't we just talking about managing part of the software engineering process and it's engineering and, you know, so what's the psychology and politics stuff uh, you might ask? Of course, you probably aren't going to ask that because a lot of you have probably been at this for a while. <laughs> probably are like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know the problem. Um, so, you know, testing is, uh, is, is evaluating the quality of other people's work. So uh, obviously that has some interesting political and psychological dynamics associated with it. Um, testing is something that um, happens uh, predominantly at the end of a project or the end of a sprint and can lead to the discovery of unwelcome news late in the game. Um, so that can lead to people having to make hard decisions. People don't like making hard decisions. Trust me, um, it's uh, not not any fun, and um, you know, often the uh, uh, that that results in some interesting psychological and political uh, uh, elements there, um, and we can exacerbate this as test professionals by just not really paying attention to how we sound and how we're being perceived, how we are, uh, how, how people are seeing the effect that we're having on the project. You know, given, I assume, all of our intentions are good on this webinar. This is not a matter of convincing you not to be evil, but it is a matter of, uh, in some cases, um, uh, convincing other people that what you're doing is actually of good intentions and, and uh, above and beyond that uh, helpful to the project. So let's take a look at these issues. Starting with the psychological factors, so I've identified five important psychological factors here which I will explain in more depth. Um, causality, confusion, blaming the victim, Cognitive dissonance, confirmation bias, and projection. So, <laughs> causal confusion. Uh, 
X and Y happened. X happened first, then Y happened. So therefore, X caused Y. Uh, this is something that happens all the time. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, it's um, a natural human thing, part of the way your brain works to try to see see patterns. And of course, there's an evolutionary advantage to this because if something bad happens and you're able to remember the things that happened right before it, you can say, oh, well, when I see that those those precursor things happening, that means something bad's about to happen. I better pay attention. So there's a strong uh, evolutionary um, reason why you, you tend to sort of just immediately connect the dots. Um, but in fact, what could be going on is that um, something else, Z, happened that you're not aware of, and Z actually caused X and, and then Y. Or Z happened and X happened, and Z and X together caused Y, but X by itself didn't cause Y. Um, so this is the kind of thing where people say, well, look, you know, look, there's a correlation between things, therefore there's, there's causality. Well, not necessarily. There can be correlations of various kinds, and, um, but, but still causality is not there. Um, so, you know, the, the common way that we encounter this in testing, well, I'm going to show you another example. The common way we encounter this in testing is uh, this, well, the project was on schedule until testing started, or everything looked good on the sprint until testing started. So, the test, therefore, testing is the thing that caused things to go badly. Um, and, you know, this, is, this reminds me of this quote from Mencken here, of for every complex problem, there is an answer that is simple, clear, and wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is the kind of thing that your brain is doing. It's, it's wanting to find something that's simple and clear, um, but that does not mean that that is right. Um, another thing that's important to remember, as I kind of alluded to, is that it might be true that what you, what, that, that's, that some factor has an effect on an outcome that's being observed, but it might actually be a fairly trivial uh, effect. So uh, there's the 80-20 rule that basically says that 80% of the outcomes are due to 20% of the causal factors, and the other 80% of the causal factors only account for 20% of the outcomes. Uh, and that is true in a whole lot of different places and in a whole lot of different ways, um, but people forget that. So they just immediately look for an explanation there might be a causal relationship there, but maybe it's not the most important one. And of course, there's always the the possibility that we have a rational sounding explanation for something, but it's actually incorrect. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So to give you an example of this, uh, I was doing an assessment for a client, and uh, they, they tested some pretty complex uh, uh, software that did um, that does um, industrial controls, uh, things like pharmaceutical plants and oil factories and oil refineries and factories and so forth. Stuff that you know that really matters. Like if, it, if the software fails, there are some severe consequences to it, and it's complicated. So uh, they also one one of the problems that these guys had that I found in their in the assessment was that there was a very high rate of, of rejected bug reports, false positives, basically situations where the tester reported a bug and then um, on further investigation, then the behavior actually turned out, turned out to be correct behavior. So, uh, you know, the, the assertion that was made by most of the people, many of the people that I talked to about this, when I asked, well, why do you think we're having this, this large number of false positives, they said, well, that's simple as the testers don't have enough experience working in actual uh, what they call plants. They don't have enough plant experience, meaning uh, refineries, factories, pharmaceutical um, uh, labs, and so forth. Um, and everybody believed that, that I talked to about it, and, and it's, you know, it's a very rational sounding explanation because you can kind of see why that might work. Well, that makes sense. Well, okay, so what I did is I asked the test manager to give me two numbers for each person, which one was the number of years of, of actual plant experience they had prior to coming to testing, and then the second one was 
their own personal reject rate, percentage uh, report reject rate. I just said, I don't, don't give me names. I don't want to know. I don't need to know. What I'm looking for here is correlation and causality. Um, well, you can see the scatter plot that I prepared here from those two numbers for each tester. And uh, basically, it looks like a shotgun blast hit the paper, right? It's like the, uh, like the, the uh, right-hand side of a shotgun blast, um, which is, you know, classic random output and outcome. And you can see the R squared value, which measures the correlation, is, is point, uh, two, point zero 0.02, excuse me, which is, you know, basically zero, zero correlation. R squared values to indicate correlation would need to be like 0.8 and above. So no correlation, no causality. So clearly that particular explanation, while sounds completely rational, is totally wrong. Um, so, you know, this, this is an example. Decisions could have been made based on a assessment and analysis that sounded rational, like, for example, lay off all the testers with less than 10 years of plant experience. But would that have helped? Hmm. We can see here is that some of the testers who had less than 10 years plant experience had uh, re uh, reject rates that were as low as testers who had 20, 30, 40, or 20 or 30 years of, of experience. So blaming the victim, um, this is where something goes wrong that's not actually part of the test process itself, but testing is blamed. So you know, typical thing here is you find bugs um, and that results in some sort of delay or in the case of um, Agile, maybe a particular user story doesn't make an iteration and the uh, and people are frustrated and people say, why didn't you find that sooner? You know, it's your fault. Nobody asks the developer, why did you guys put that bug in there? <laughs> I mean, I've never heard it, but... Why didn't you find that sooner? Okay, well, that's blaming the victim. I mean, you you as a tester are as inconvenienced by this occurrence as anyone else. Um, you're certainly not the, the cause, you know, but nonetheless, blame. Um, now, you might ask in the slide I just put up, go, okay, for those testers, who are getting blamed for bad bug reports and, and especially being told, well, you know, the inexperienced people are the ones who, who create most of the bad bug reports, and that wasn't true. You might say, well, okay, but what was true? Well, it turned out that the actual reason, the, main, the, the, the primary cause of most of the rejected bug reports was because the specifications were bad and conflicting. There were two levels of specifications. There was... Uh, I forget the exact name, but it's sort of the analog of a product requirements document or marketing requirements document at a high level, and then there was like a detailed design specification at a more detailed level, a lower level, and the specs weren't very good, and worse yet, what would happen is that there would be conflicting information between the high level and the low level specifications. Um, the low-level specifications were generally more accurate because they had been updated most recently, but the testers were told that the primary reference, their primary test oracle, was to be the high-level specification. So, you know, effectively what was happening here was testing was being blamed for acting on the bad information that they had been given and the bad guidance they'd been given for how to use that uh, externally provided information. So, so it's really important as a test manager to make sure that you can measure this kind of stuff of how how these external factors are creating issues of inefficiency, ineffectiveness, uh, dissatisfaction with testing, and so forth. That, that you know, because if you can't demonstrate that this these things are happening for reasons beyond your control and happening to you as much, much instead of by you, then um, you know, then then it's very difficult to push back on this victim blaming. Um, so, 
a couple other things, and these are I, put, I deal with these on a single slide because they are strongly related um, psychological um, attributes, I guess you'd say. People are really bad at hearing what they don't want to hear. They're really bad at that. Um, and I guess, you know, newsflash, um, for those of you who haven't realized this yet, you're really bad at it too. We all are. We, we all have this. The, the co cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias are universal human things. You cannot get away from it. It's just like eating. You know, you, you have to do it. Um, you have to eat. <laughs> you know, this stuff is going to happen to you. Uh, now, what you can do is try to be aware of when it is happening to you and shake it off as quickly as you can. But thing is that you're colleagues, um, you know, I mean, you're there to be a test manager, you're not, not there to be a psychological uh, counselor or a spiritual growth coach or something like that, right? Uh, so, you know, you getting in other people's stuff and, go, you know, somebody has this, you go, oh, I think you're uh, suffering from confirmation bias right now. That's unlikely to be helpful, but you should be able to recognize these two things when you see them. So what are they? Cognitive dissonance. Um, your brain, when confronted with unexpected information, um, will have a lot of difficulty processing it. Now, I'll, I'll give you a non-testing example. There was a famous uh, painter who took advantage of cognitive dissonance by painting uh, paintings that uh, um, had something unexpected on them. And the one I saw um, was a painting of a guy, um, and it, had, it was being used in an um, uh, absolute vodka ad that was on Sunset Boulevard as I was driving along Sunset Boulevard out in L.A. visiting a client. And um, so I look up and I see, okay, here's a guy, smiling guy, picture of, of uh, a bottle of absolute vodka sitting next to him. I'm like, yeah, sure, I guess vodka makes the guy smile. It, it, it can do that if that's how you react to alcohol. Uh, and then um, I look up again because something struck me as weird about it. I look up at it again. And I'm like, okay, smiling guy, bottle of alcohol. Okay, whatever. It, was, it wasn't until the third time that I looked at it that I realized that the guy had, in the painting of this guy, there were two mouths, two smiling mouths, identical smiling mouths, one directly above the other, um, more or less in an appropriate spot between the nose and the chin. So what my brain had been doing was when I looked at it, it was like, okay, well, that's weird. I must have misseen that. And so it saw the what happened when my brain got the images from the eye that had two mouths on it. It just processed that into one mouth. Um, but, you know, there was this kind of weird feeling. This is a thing that made me want to look at it multiple times. I was like, wait, something's weird about that. Is that what, what's wrong with this picture moment? And... You know, it was finally, it was the third try. I was like, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, very clever. Um, <laughs> so vodka sometimes does that, too. Um, so um, <clears throat> what does this have to do with testing? Well, th this one example of this is that you're sitting there in a, in a daily stand-up meeting or a test uh, or a project status meeting, and you're reporting your test results, and it's totally obvious to you that, the current schedule is untenable or that the uh, set of anticipated deliverables for the sprint simply are not going to be ready. There's just no way that's going to happen. It's obvious to you, but not to other people. And when, as you keep saying, well, you know, okay, so th these things are not likely to make it. And then people are asking you questions and you try to explain and that doesn't sink in. Part of what's happening there is, comp is cognitive dissonance, and usually that will be expressed, or oftentimes that's expressed, as a form of frustration. They get frustrated with you because they're like, oh, well, I'm having difficulty understanding what this person is saying, therefore they're not expressing themselves well because they're not aware of the fact that the, the processing difficulty is <laughs> purely one of receiving, not one of sending. Uh, now, somewhat similar related to this is confirmation bias. So confirmation bias, again, we all have this, just like cognitive dissonance. 
Confirmation bias is the tendency to seek out and agree with uh, information that confirms your existing opinions. Feels good. Hey, I was right. Yay. I'm so brilliant. Um, <clears throat> you're, you, you know, you do it. Trust me. I do it. I, I, I can catch myself doing it. I do it every day. Cognitive distance is a little less frequent because I'm not always confronted with information that's unexpected to me. But confirmation bias, absolutely. I know for a fact I do it every day. I can catch myself doing it at least once a day. I bet if you practice, you'll do that too. Um, so people around you are going to do that. So if you're the lone lone voice in the in, in crying in the stand-up wilderness or the uh, weekly project status meeting wilderness saying, Look, you know, the test results say we're we're headed in a bad direction. Things are not going to turn out well. And everybody else is going, ah, we think everything's fine. Then it's not unlikely that those people who want to believe that everything is fine will accept the information, the opinions offered by people who say everything's fine and reject your um, findings. Uh and they can be dismissive about this. They might even be angry with you. In some cases, I've heard stories of test managers being accused of trying to sabotage the product or the project. Oh, you just want us to fail. <laughs> now, if you actually do as a test manager, that's a whole separate dysfunction that I talked about in, in, in uh, webinars a, a while ago. Um, but, uh, you know, assuming that you don't, um, why would they think that? Well, because they're trying to explain why would you be saying what you're saying? Could it be that you're right? Oh, no, 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 because that wouldn't confirm what they already believe. So it must be that you're wrong. So why are you saying this wrong thing? See? Now, um, these two guys cognitive dissonance and uh, confirmation bias, um, team up with this guy, projection, to make this a whole lot of fun. Projection is where people tend to project how they feel about something or someone onto something or someone else. Uh, in this case, the something that people will be feeling about will be the test results, and the someone is going to be you. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as killing the messenger. This is the more common, the common uh, phrase for it, for uh, projection. Um, and uh, where does that come from? If you're if you're curious, like we heard that a bunch of times, what is that? Where did that come from? Um, no, it's not like you know somebody, some messenger in a trench warfare getting shot by an angry officer. It goes way way back before that. Uh, it's Greek mythology. Uh, Hercules uh, got a message from somebody. I forget the name of this poor demigod. And uh, he, Hercules picked the poor beast up by the feet and bashed its brains in. Um, so, you know, <laughs> next time you're, you're suffering from projection, you, know, you mean onto you rather than you personally suffering from it, just be glad that you're not dealing with Hercules. But definitely there is this potential for, you know, you're delivering bad news and, and somehow you become the bad guy. Uh, now, you're not going to be able to change this human psychology. I mean, you know, you're just not. I mean, <laughs> and, and, you know, if you, if you ever do, as a test manager, gain some sort of magic wand to fix some brokenness of human nature, please don't start with any of the stuff that I'm complaining about here because obviously war is a much bigger problem. So I'd prefer if, if you ever get that magic wand and you've got exactly one use of it, just, you know, um, change change whatever that is that we inherited from chimpanzees that makes us want to have war all the time and make that go away. <laughs> we can deal with the rest of this stuff. But um, <clears throat> the projection, you know, this is where, you know, you get to be the bad guy. Um, and you're not going to be able to change that. But what you can do is you can try to lessen the the impact of it. Uh, so certainly, you know, um, what you want to do is is be 
uh, a professional pessimist. Now, what I mean by professional pessimist here is that you're pessimistic in the sense of you, you expect the, the product to have problems. Um, and, and, you know, you're the guy on the team that, that plays that role. This is one of the values of having an independent professional tester on the team is it, it's your job to think about what could go wrong. And it's your job to expect things to go wrong. And it's not anybody else's job. So you need to be a pessimist. But it's also important that you be professional about it. Um, so when you make recommendations, don't just go, oh, well, it would be really neat if we did, you know. No, have, you know, facts. Um, use facts. Use data to back up what you're recommending. Uh, being a quality cop saying, I'm the one who gets to decide whether we're ready to release. Uh, that's, a, that's a loser proposition. Also being a process cop and telling people, well, these things are all going wrong because you guys over there are screwing this part of the process up. Now, that's, that, that's probably not your role, and it won't win, win friends and influence people. Um, unless you are coming in from the outside and influencing an outside uh, telling people how to do things, you know, acting as an outside auditor or something, passing judgment on other people's processes or people, probably not a good idea. Again, unlikely to win you any friends. Um, and certainly uh, gloating, um, not a good plan, especially if you were right and everybody else was wrong. That it because it's like nobody wants to hear that. It, yeah, you can feel happy that you were the one who knew, but you know, it just is not going to it's not going to do you any good to say that out loud. It might momentarily make you feel better, but uh in the long run, not good. So, metrics. Um you know, why do I like metrics? Well, for any number of reasons, but here are a few here. Um, getting out of subjectivity. Notice that a lot of a lot of what I was just talking about from the psychology point of view, uh, part of the problem there was it's it's subjective. It, it, it can come across as, you know, a battle of dueling opinions. But if I'm able to use metrics, then it's like, well, you know, argue with the numbers. If you want to argue with the numbers, but this is what the numbers say. You know, somebody said, why are you saying that? Well, because because of this, because of these things, right? Um, another thing it helps is don't just show up as a tester and assume that people know, hey, my job is to just deliver, you know, drop drop news on them. You know, help train people, your key testing stakeholders about, okay, this is the kind of information I'm going to provide. This is what I can help you do from a decision-making point of view. It's the kind of metrics I'm going to be able to come to meetings with, those kinds of things. Uh, so have those conversations, ideally up front, rather than, you know, waiting until you're in the midst of a project and then people are misinterpreting your your results and you're trying to educate them because, you know, back, again, back to confirmation bias. Out-of-the-box metrics, there are plenty of test management tools out there, open source as well as commercial, and a lot of their built-in reporting sucks. Sorry, tool vendors, but it does. Um, and I guess I can't really blame the tool vendors because uh, it can't be all things to all people, and different people have different needs. So what you want to do is use a technique like goal question metric, which I've discussed in other webinars and and actually figure out okay well what what are the objectives for this project and what metrics can I use to measure where we stand with respect to those objectives and how can I present that information have that as a conversation with stakeholders fine-tune that information as you go um, rather than to say hey I use whatever my test management tool gives me um, and uh, stay tuned with people um, Stay, stay tuned to people's uh, perceptions of your results. I mean, you know, this stuff can change over time. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the old line in the, in the music industry, of, you know, you're only as good as your last album or only as good as your last show, you know, 
that's kind of kind of uh, applies here too is that uh, accuracy credibility timeliness uh, these are things that are evaluated on an ongoing basis and um, people might not be sitting there waiting for you to screw up looking for you to screw up but certainly if you screw up in terms of results reporting that can result in, in instant damage to the credibility of your of your uh, your results and even you and people won't necessarily tell you that you, you have to feel that out um, all right so political factors look at psychology look at now let's look at politics second half of this presentation um, so I've identified a few here mission clarity uh, QA and other keyword titles, organizational placement, everything but programming, managing your fellow managers, schedule pressures and testing, and missing or inadequate specifications. So, mission and policy. So, um, there's an old joke of if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And um, same thing sort of applies here with testing. If you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, you know, there's any number of ways you can go about accomplishing it. Uh, but the problem with that is, of course, that uh, if you don't know what you're going, you're supposed to accomplish, um, that which you end up accomplishing, if anything, is unlikely to be well aligned with the organizational needs. So what you really want to do is have a conversation with stakeholders, uh, testing stakeholders about, you know, what is it that we need to accomplish here? What are, what are our objectives for testing? Finding bugs, building confidence, reducing risk, providing information. Those are fairly typical objectives. You might have additional ones such as regulatory compliance. So you need to make sure that you get those and be a little more specific than just find defects. You want to Maybe talk about what areas of the product and what types of defects you want to focus on. And then once you've got those objectives, this is where you start talking about effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction metrics. And then once you've set the metrics, you want to actually have goals, targets for those. Um, and now ideally, all this stuff would go into what's referred to in ISDQB land as a test policy. You can call it whatever you want, test mission statement. Um, stuff that we do and why I mean it really doesn't matter and it doesn't have to be a document per se it can be a, uh, a wiki page or intranet site or whatever but it's it's valuable to have you know this is what we do this is why we do it this is how we measure how well we do it uh, this is what our targets are for those measurements uh, so that we can have some clear agreement about what success looks like Now, um, clearly defined job, very, very important. Um, again, you know, if, you're, if, if it's not real clear what your job is and what you're trying to accomplish, um, the, the odds that people will, will see you as a success are uh, pretty, uh, pretty low. Uh, you're likely to end up... Uh, being seen as, you know, as the slide shows here, the Don, Don Quixote, the lone champion of quality, uh, off tilting, tilting the windmills. Um, so I'll give you an example of this, um, this kind of lack of specificity here. Um, I remember uh, taking on a job as a test manager early in my career and uh, got in there, and I was like, you know, day-to-day -day stuff is going on. I was taking over an existing operation, so there was a lot of just sort of keeping the plate spinning on the pencil stuff. But one afternoon, there was kind of a lull in the action, and I decided, hey, let me just go around and have a conversation with people and ask them what, my what they think my job is. And it was eye-opening because I got a lot of different um, answers to that question. And so, you know, this is a good conversation to have, and title, manner, title matters here. 
So if your title is QA manager, quality assurance manager, even quality control, maybe, uh, I would worry about that because the implication is then you own the outcome from a product quality point of view. Do you? Really? Are you a process cop? Are you in charge of process? Now, maybe you're okay with doing that. I, personally, I think that's kind of a not such a great idea. But, I mean, if you're okay with doing that then uh, and you want to take that on, then okay. But make sure that you've got the, the, the knowledge for that because I saw uh, somebody, uh, well, I've seen more than one person make this mistake, but most notably, I saw somebody get herself in real trouble as a director of testing by doing this, you know, I am, I am the god of, or goddess in her case, of quality and telling people you need to do your job this way, you need to do your job this way because that's what's going to guarantee quality. And meanwhile, people were saying, well, you know, it's not like she's doing her job that well and the test team's a mess. So personally, I like the idea of, of being referred to as a tester, or test manager, test professional a lot more than I like QA uh, just because QA has that uh, potentially dangerous implication of, yeah, you know, we, uh, we, we, we are the quality magic wand that, um, you know, makes quality problems go away. Now, independence. Where should you be? Um, having a test team embedded within a development team and test manager reporting to a development manager. Problem here is that um, there's going to be editing and self-editing in a lot of cases. Editing in the sense of your findings will not necessarily get passed up the organizational hierarchy um, without some changes to them. The self-editing comes when Basically, to put to, to be blunt about it, the person who writes your annual performance evaluation is the person whose work you're saying sucks, <laughs> and that's just a tough spot to be in. So you want to have some amount of independence. Now, this can be um, challenging in agile, but what I've seen work in agile is is what's called a matrixed approach. So in a matrixed approach, you have a test manager, and there are testers within the test team. Uh, and those testers get delegated on an ongoing basis to some of the uh, Agile teams. And I covered this in the um, December webinar that we did just a couple weeks ago, uh, if you want to take a look at that. But, but basically, the, the key takeaway here from a political point of view is the organizational structure has to be such that it promotes rather than suppresses tester independence. Now, another thing that's interesting from a political point of view is tendency of organizations to dump non-testing roles into test teams. So things that I've seen happen, I've seen test teams being asked to take charge of configuration management, release management, customer support, business analysis, system administration, uh, front-end quality management like managing the code review process, the requirements review process, uh, story, user story grooming, um, managing development labs, hardware and development labs, uh, creating training and training data and training procedures, actually delivering the training to the operation staff or the end users. You know, just stuff like here, <laughs> you're, you're a test manager and you know on this. Now, you might say, hmm, okay. Don't know if I like that, but before you do, step back and ask yourself, there are usually, and again, you know, accepting that there can be multiple explanations for this, but in my experience, there are usually two explanations for why you're being asked to do this. One is a compliment. <clears throat> One, the, the, the compliment is you are seen as a manager who has taken on a difficult and relatively thankless job and done a good job of it. And there are these other relatively thankless jobs, which are nonetheless important, just like testing, and they think, oh, well, if he or she did a good job of that, I'll give them this. Okay. 
The other possibility is that people look and go, you know, those testers, you know, they really don't have much to do other than at the end of each sprint or the end of each project, they got to bang on the product a little bit. So in between that, they must have people just sitting around doing nothing. So let's find something for those people to do. <laughs> That's not good because that means that people don't understand the realities of testing. So you need to really um, try to figure out, if you're asked to take on some non-test role, what the motivation is. And it's really pretty easy to do that. If, if somebody asks you to take on one of these non-test roles, you just say, okay, um, that sounds interesting. Let me go off and do some planning on that, and I'll come back and let you know what I'll need in the way of additional resources to handle that. Now, if the, man if the manager responds to that by saying, great, that's great. Look forward to seeing your plan then you know that you've been complimented. People think you're a competent person and, you know, they want you to do more for them. And so, great, you know, you might as well do it. Somebody's going to do it. Um, now, if they just give you a blank look, though, and say, well, what do you mean extra resources? You got all these people that do nothing but just sit around in between test periods and the sprints or projects, then, you know, you got an education problem that you need to solve. But even here, this is actually good because you've now discovered a misunderstanding of what testing is about amongst one of your key stakeholders, and you've got an opportunity to fix it. Now, another thing that's important to keep in mind is what I refer to as directions of test management. So as a test manager, one of the things you need to do is manage inward. In other words, manage your own team. But there's also what I refer to as outward management, upward management. So outward management is management of peer level managers, managing the flow of information to them, and services from them, and so forth. Upward management is managing people to whom you report or are somehow above you in the hierarchy. And these things are all different. So outward management, you know, really um, one of the key things here is making sure that uh, people um, understand uh, what you're doing and how, how what you're doing relates to them and so forth. Um, what's the service that I provide? How is it valuable? Um, how does it help them do their job? Um, and that's, that's true for upward and, and outward management. Now, for upward management, uh, this is... Uh, particularly critical because um, you really need to think of your managers as your, your most important internal customers, and, and they're the people that approve your budgets. And so they really need to understand what you're doing and why. Um, I had a client once tell me about a uh, test manager. The guy had come in, he was managing uh, testing and on the startup organization, and as a counterpart on the development side. And I happen to know both of these guys, the development manager and the test manager. And what happened was that the, uh, uh, it was a startup, as I said, and uh, the venture capitalists who were funding it came in and said uh, to the um, management team there, you're spending too much money and you're spending it too fast and you're going to run out of money before there's a product. And we don't want to have to go through and, and raise more money. We want you to deliver a product based on the money we've already allocated. So management sat back and said, hmm, how are we going to do this? Uh, they looked at their burn rate, and they were like, okay, well, we're just going to have to massively cut staff. So what they did is they went to all of the line managers and said, unless you can explain to us a good reason otherwise, as of two weeks from today, your, your head count is cut in half. Development manager managed to make a good pitch, make a good case for why his team was necessary. Only a very few people were cut. Test manager, you know, unable to do it. Half the testers were cut. I asked the development manager later, hey, what happened with the test manager? He's like, well, you know, he just couldn't really explain to anybody what exactly the value of the testing was. And he resorted to a lot of platitudes about, you know, quality is free and those sort of things, but wasn't really able to connect to management and what they cared about. And as a result, you know, they're uh, um, cut. So 
you know, don't don't just think of this as, oh, you know, this is so tedious dealing with these bean counters and, you know, trying to convince them that what I do matters. Everybody should know that what I do matters. You know, I saw this title of a, a talk. Um, uh, I've seen something similar in other places, too, where it's like how to talk to a manager about testing if you really have to. Well, the underlying premise of that is just completely ass backwards. Yes, you do really have to unless you happen to be independently wealthy and you don't have to worry about where your your next meal is coming from. But in that case, I'd kind of ask you, why are you working anyway? But, you know, yeah, you, you know, testing provides a service to the rest of the team as a whole. And if if you're not able to convince people that that service is valuable, then you're you're on borrowed time. So some things to keep in mind when you're communicating with your managers. Um, you know, again, try to get out of the quality cop role. Try to try to say, look, I'm here to assess quality and give you insights into quality. I'm not I'm not a quality magic wand. Communicate about testing in business terms. Think about things like um, what's the cost of a bug in production versus the cost of a bug found in testing. How much money do you save the organization every year based on that that difference? Uh, be able to measure, you know, be able to show that these are these are what our results are, this is what they mean. Certainly accurate and timely deliverable delivery of information is is essential here. Accurate, of course, so that people make the right decisions from it. Timely, of course, because people need that information in time to make the right decision. Um, when you talk about problems, uh, talk about problems in terms of how to fix them and move the project forward, not like, oh, we're doomed, or just say, here's this horrible, you know, stinking issue. I, I refer to this as the dead fish on the conference room table problem. You don't want to just do that. You want to talk about, here's how we're going to move the project forward. Uh, dog and pony shows, this refers to, you know, if there are big project status meetings or if the senior management comes in from out of town or something and there's going to be, you know, chance for you to get some face time with with senior management or as part of this meeting. Do it and do it well. Um, again, this you know this might seem like a waste of time, but but trust me, it's not. It's, it's uh, you want to have have a, a good reputation and good visibility. The urgent and the important. This refers to not only putting out the fire when the fires break out and being part of that, but also thinking about how did the fire break out to begin with, taking steps to reduce that. Um, <clears throat> when you learn something that's bad news, make sure that bad news gets to the right people at the right time. Um, now, when you deliver bad news to people, make sure that you differentiate between I'm giving you information you need to know and help, help, I need you to come in and solve my problem, okay? Uh, make sure that people can see the difference in what you're doing there. And when you do choose to escalate and ask for help, be very careful, very deliberate about how you do it, um, because otherwise you'll end up getting micromanaged and you'll be perceived as a bad manager. Now, I mentioned um, professional pessimism, and I do think that's important, but from a political point of view, um, this goes back to a comment that a colleague of mine made years ago, a fellow named Ren McNary. Um, he said, be optimistic on the outside, pessimistic on the inside. Now, what he meant by that was, yeah, you need to keep, you need to have an expectation that you're going to find problems. That's important. But the way in which you interact with other fellow managers and people on the team has to be, yeah, we're supporting uh, project success. Um, if you're like, oh, yeah, we're going to find so many bugs, you guys will be really challenged to fix them, and, you know, you come across as perpetually negative, um, it, uh, even, again, even if you're right, um, what people will remember is not, you know, <laughs> that guy was right about how bad the product was. What they'll remember is, wow, what a negative person. I mean, it's really, you know, unenergizing to be around that individual. Now, um, slips. 
not unusual for projects to have schedule slips of one kind or another. Even Agile projects have them. Um, usually what's happening there is it's that user stories get slipped from one iteration to the next, but you know, any number of things can happen. And there are generally a whole bunch of things that are going on that cause the schedule slips to occur. It's almost never testing per se, but the thing is that the testing is what's happening when the schedule slips, and so get back to uh, getting confused about the difference between correlation and causality. And one of the things that happens over and over again, regardless of life cycle in many cases, is that management chooses to throw lots of hours long, long hours at the problem to try to catch up. Now, you could say, well, look, that's ridiculous having the testers work longer. It's, it's not like the, the reason the project is going is, is, is in trouble from a, a schedule point of view is because we're not finding enough bugs and we're not doing enough testing. You know, we're way out ahead of you guys, and so you figure it out. Um, the thing is that if you say that, and even if that's true, what can happen is you get this, you get hit on the forehead with the not a team player stamp, and that doesn't come off. Uh, once once you get that reputation as being not a team player and a person who's going to cause problems, um, it's very difficult to uh, resolve that. And um, when you're in a schedule slip situation or other project panic, project crisis type of situation, there can often be firings, layoffs associated with that. And what can happen is that in those situations, people will often use that as an excuse to go after people that they have a grudge against. And if you're walking around with a big, bright, shiny, not a team player stamp on your forehead, you're, you, know, you and your team have pretty much signed up for it. Um, so, you know, working long hours to try to catch up, that can happen. Probably have to just deal with it. Um, other sorts of dysfunctional behaviors can happen when schedule slips occur too that you need to try to uh, to manage in, in some way or another. Um, I've seen things like, uh, let's just do a bunch of ad hoc testing and throw the thing out there last minute reorgs in a desperate attempt of like maybe if we change the org structure or some magic will happen. Um, testers being pulled out of the test team or the test team being completely dissolved. Oh, we'll just have them work side by side with the developer. So be at your be be at the top of your game when schedule slips occur as a test manager because uh, that can often uh, lead to um, problems. <laughs> problems for you uh, from from a testing point of view and again you can say well you know I mean that's just, this is this natural outgrowth of other things that happened and things other people did that may very well be true but you know that's uh, that may not save you now specifications um, yes you need adequate information um, but you have to be very careful about how you insist on that, uh, especially in Agile methodologies, uh, pushing back and saying, I don't have enough information to create my tests. I don't have enough information to determine what the expected results are. Um, you know, can, can lead to some political kinds of problems. Um, so you might say, well, okay, I, I get that. I get that people don't like to be pestered, but I mean, what do I do? Well, here are some ideas of sources of information if you don't have good user stories and good requirements and good um, test oracles and test basis documents as a whole. Um, competing products that are out there, you can look at those. Talk to the salespeople, talk to the marketing people. You could say, well, yeah, those, those are the people who should have given me the information to begin with. Well, well they didn't, so get over it. Um, Customer support or tech support, another source of information, especially about stuff not to forget to test because they're, they're, they're the, the um, unwitting and, and uh, victims and aggrieved parties when that happens. Um, you know, you do have to empower yourself and your testers to take your best guess in these circumstances. And definitely, even though I think this is always a good attitude for a tester, Definitely, when you're dealing with an underspecified situation, adopt the uh, mantra, if in doubt, it's a bug. 
Um, make sure that people understand that there's going to be some inefficiency associated with this. Uh, what I've seen is just as an educated guess, um, your numbers may vary, but certainly a 20 to 30 percent hit on efficiency and a 10 to 20 percent hit on defect finding effectiveness are not um, unusual if you're testing in a highly underspecified or entirely underspecified scenario. Okay, so some conclusions here. Software engineering is done by people, so psychology matters. And you can either ignore that and say that's the icky, icky wetware part of the whole equation. I don't like that. I got into engineering because I like stuff to be objective and squared away and so forth. And so I'm going to ignore the psychology, uh, which is not a good move when you're in management. Better is to recognize and accept that human psychology is going to be a factor here and uh, try to manage that with uh, objectivity metrics, as I mentioned. Software engineering is also a collective human activity, human endeavor. Collective human endeavors mean that there's going to be politics. Now, again, you could say, well, I went into engineering because I hate that kind of crap. Um, you know, I'm going to ignore that. Again, you you know you can do that, but you're setting yourself up for for problems. Uh, so just accept you know there's going to be politics, and one of the ways of managing it is saying I am here, me and my team, we're here as a service, providing a service to the project team, um, and uh, you know I'm going to focus on providing the best service I can. So I would say that if you try to ignore these things. This is where you're likely to end up going crazy um, because you're going to be beset by all sorts of challenges associated with not dealing with the politics and not dealing with the psychology. If you just say, look, I'm, I'm going to accept that there's the psychological stuff, I'm going to accept that there's the political stuff, and I'm going to manage it, I'm going to deal with it, then uh, you're uh, much more likely to succeed. Okay, so this concludes the presentation, so I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, first, a quick word about our services. As I mentioned earlier, we have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services to companies looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. If you receive valuable information from our free webinars, please help us continue to provide them by making RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. We're happy to provide a quote for any such help you might need. So contact us at info at rbcs-us.com. Um, so let's see, what do we got here in the way of questions? Uh, Keith says, no question, just a thank you for another informative and helpful webinar for me as a QA manager. You are quite welcome, Keith. And... Uh, Keith, thank you for your um, past uh, patronage of our company, past business. I appreciate that, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, uh, work with you and your, your testers in 2017, providing some uh, training or consulting services. Um, Garth says, I just want to say thanks. This has been a, has been a great insight. This has put what I've recently <laughs> experienced in perspective uh, I'm I'm glad that's that was the um, intention of uh, of this presentation. Uh, let's try to if if you're kind of maybe maybe you're newish to this and kind of struggling with some of these things, um, you know, yeah, you're you're not alone. Um, I know when I started off as a test manager in the 1990s, and yes, that does make me a dinosaur. Um, you know, at first I thought, my God, it must just be me. I, I must just be a complete jackass, and, and all of this bad stuff is happening to me because I'm a jerk. Now, I will own that I can have a personality that some people like and some people don't like. Um, so certainly so I, I'm responsible for some of the things that happened to me earlier in my career that arose entirely based on my not-so-charming-all-the-time personality. But... 
Um, some of this stuff was just, you know, it's it's the nature of the beast to have these psychological and political challenges, and my not recognizing that what, them for what they were and not dealing with them effectively was the thing that made me do a much uh, worse job of it. Um, so I hope that, Garth, that to the extent that this is, uh, you know, giving you some insights, that you'll be able to now be more effective when you get in these situations that are making you think, good Lord, what the hell is going on here? Uh, Juliet says, this is just a comment. I am winding down on managing a large test effort and encountered almost all of the scenarios you mentioned during the presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, see, you know, <laughs> there used to be, I, I think it was a beer commercial back when I was growing up. So this is like, <laughs> this is a long time ago, <laughs> this is the 1970s. Uh, but I believe the tagline for this beer um, was the good things in life stay that way, um, which is kind of a testament to the ad agency that created it that I can remember the tagline, though it's not so good that I can't remember which beer it was associated with. So good for them for being so memorable, but, you know, it didn't do their client much good. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, thing, the thing about politics and, um, and psychology is that it just doesn't change. Um, and, you know, so it's, these things happen all over the place. Uh, let's see, I got a, a question from Amit. He said, about blaming the victim, why is the tester a victim? I can get the messenger harbinger of bad news, but why, but why the victim? Well, the, the tester is a victim in those circumstances I was describing before because the tester is part of the project team as well. And so the th kinds of things that I was describing happening, those are bad news for the project um, and they tend to have a lot of unpleasant consequences for the participants in the project team. So, you know, to say that the tester who is not or, or the test manager or test team in general, the, the, who are not the people who put the bugs in um, are, you know, should should be on the receiving end of a lot of negative commentary about consequences of too many bugs or late discovery of bugs, etc., it really is blaming the victim. Um, got a question from Scott. Uh, are these slides available after the webinar? Well, heck, Scott, they're actually available before the webinar. They're out there on the website now. Uh, but better yet, <clears throat> the recorded webinar will be posted on our uh, web page and on our YouTube channel um, with usually within a few days so if there's somebody out there in your universe you're thinking wow this person really should have been in this presentation then um, what you want to do is in two or three days go out check our YouTube uh, channel um, and or just or better yet just go subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, when the webinar is posted for the link along encourage the person to subscribe as well have them take a look at it um, the um, by the way our YouTube YouTube channel now um, 188,000 views on that and uh, this morning we cracked a thousand subscribers and um, encourage you to, if you're not already a subscriber to that, go be one. And the reason being that this entire series of webinars, all, geez, where are we now? Seven years on it? Eight years? Something, nine years? I don't know. It's been, it's been a long time. Uh, it's been, we've been doing these free monthly webinars for a long time. Pretty much all of them have been recorded and posted out there. Um, so... Um, you know, it's, it's a fantastic resource, totally free. Um, so, uh, you know, take a listen to it. We, we do ask you to listen to the, uh, the advertisements because that's what, uh, helps, helps keep the lights on. But, um, you know, other than that, other than a few, um, seconds of your time at the beginning and end of each webinar that's recorded and posted out there, we ask you for nothing. 
Uh, let's see. Sinisa says, again, you addressed very important topics. Your choice of topics for webinars is really impressive. Thanks, Rex. Thank you, Sinisa. Let me take a sip of water here. I want to add something to that. Um, one of the things that, I mean, we're going to continue doing these webinars as long as people continue showing up and our mailing list keeps growing. Um, we are we have recognized though as some of you who follow on twitter and facebook and so forth may have already picked up on this we've recognized that in some cases 90 minutes or even 60 minutes is just too long for people so what we're going to do is we're going to launch a new sort of subset of our webinar series called one key idea so every other webinar instead of being you know 60 ish minutes plus 30 minute q and a is going to be 20 minutes and it's going to be super short super focused on one key idea that I'm going to go in I'm going to explain and um, uh, that's going to be that so you know it's it's something where you know gee I don't have an hour um, that that's that time isn't available to me okay well how about 20 minutes these will also be recorded and posted just like these these standard webinars are don't worry, we're still going to do the standard webinar, so it's going to be an alternate thing. Every other webinar is going to be the one key idea, the shorter, more focused one, and then together with the longer ones, and both of them will be posted. Both both in the series will be posted. Uh, we think you're going to like that. We think that this is going to also allow us to attract a lot of other people who would otherwise be coming to these webinars, but say, I just can't, I just can't set aside an hour for this. Um, so hopefully you guys will sign up for that. The first one I'm doing uh, next month will be on pairwise testing. I'm going to demonstrate how to do it using a tool called ACTS, A-C-T-S, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So I'll briefly explain the concept of pairwise testing, and then I will uh, um, demo the tool. And the tool is free, free for download anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, so you'll walk away. Uh, with a with a skill that you can immediately put to use if if you're dealing with a kind of problem that um, pairwise testing is about solving, which you know many people are. Uh, Lena says, "Like the new webinar idea? Cool, thanks, Lena. Spread the word. Um, I'm I'm hoping that it'll be very popular with people because, like I said, it's it's a quick it's a quick kind of lightning thing of you know, boom. Here's a here's a solution for you and." Uh, it's something that um, even even busy people can make a little time for. Uh, let's see. Amit has a, another question, comment here. Are there any studies that review the impact of tester independence on test efficiency in agile environments? Seems to me that there is very little reason for self-censorship and for external censorship when testing is not looked upon as finding coding errors but rather as let's try and find our mistakes before the customers do. Okay, so let me let me split this into two things because the comment that you made about very little reason for self-censorship and or external censorship if testing is seen as, you know, let's try and find the problems um, before the customers do, um, that's true regardless of life cycle. And really, truly, that should always have been that that should always be the perspective that uh, that people have of, you know, and then one of the messages that we as testers should be sending to people outside of testing is, especially developers, we're here to make you look good. We're here to help to help the 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 team uh, deliver the highest quality product. We're here to that that's you know that's what we're in service of, right? Not we're here to make you look like fools. We're here to trip you up. That should never be the the perspective you know there's there's that joke that goes around about testing sometimes where and and somebody told me they'd actually seen this in the form of a bumper sticker uh that basically said we're not happy until you're not happy now that might be funny uh kind of but it's also not because i think unfortunately a lot of testers have have internalized that and uh and uh, if if your goal as a tester is to make other people unhappy by giving them bad news and then reveling in how lousy that makes them feel, you know I, I think you're you're just you're in the wrong 
in the wrong line of work. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to have a tester that had that attitude in my team because I just think that they'd just be perpetually sowing discord and problems. <coughs> so <clears throat> I like that attitude in general, Amit. I think that's important. Um, but in terms of studies that review the impact of tester independence, um, what I have found as a consultant going in and doing assessments on teams is that the defect detection effectiveness of a typical independent test team will be about 85%. In other words, if they get a product that's got 100 defects in it, they'll find 85 of them. According to Capers Jones's studies, the typical defect detection effectiveness of a developer who is unit testing their own code is 25%. Now, given that there's more going on there than just the lack of independence, like there's also the fact that there are certain bugs that can't be found in unit test, there's, there's uh, certainly time constraints that are involved, time pressures that are involved. Um, you know, there are uh, um, potentially uh, issues with unit testing due to uh, legacy code and coupling and so forth, but even in high-performing agile teams where there's a lot of uh, a lot of these impediments to uh, developers doing thorough unit testing are removed. Still, what Jones finds is that the, the unit testing defect detection effectiveness caps out at 50%. Um, so, head-to-head uh, -head comparisons, um, you know, uh, uh, double-blind study kind of stuff is hard to do because a lot of times, Agile teams that have a sort of we don't need no independent testers attitude also tend to say we don't need to track bugs. So, um, you know, there's not as much data out there as I would like, but there's certainly data out there that suggests that an independent tester who doesn't have confirmation bias issues comes at the problem from a different perspective is going to be more likely to find bugs than, than somebody else. Garth says, oof, on the dev unit test, 25% defect detection effectiveness. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, oof, maybe, but, I mean, I'll, I'll take it in the sense of if if every developer would just do a decent job of unit testing their code, you know, that's 25% of bugs that don't get to uh, higher levels of testing. Same as like code reviews. Now, you know, I mean, this would be even better because if you look at similar studies from Jones, you know, uh, typical uh, code reviews are like 50% defect detection effectiveness or higher depending on how well they're done. So you figure if you could get, if you could get good code reviews, good static analysis of code and good unit testing of code all in place as part of the process uh, before the, the code is handed over, to the testers, a, a majority of the bugs that testers would otherwise have to find would have already been removed, you know. And then you you convert testing from a uh, defect detecting exercise to much more of a confidence building exercise. Garth says fair, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, Amit says, it seems I, that I don't understand what you're referring to as an independent tester since the, opposite of, since the opposite of independent tester in my mind was a tester who reports to the dev manager but is still a dedicated tester. Am I missing something? Uh, yes, I, well, no, not necessarily. I would say a tester who reports to the development manager or somebody else whose primary goal is getting a set number of features done by a particular time. Um, and that, that can be not necessarily an individual, that can be basically the team in which one is of which one is a part, like an like an agile sprint team. If you're in that situation, there are political pressures on you that are going to nudge you towards self editing of especially of bad news. Um, 
and it's going to reduce your defect detection effectiveness, at least as reported. Now, you may still be seeing that some of these defects, but you might be deciding, ah, yeah, I'm not going to bring that one up because whatever. It's going to be too controversial. It's going to it's too late in the project, and I'm going to get my butt kicked for bringing it up, you know, what have you. So that that's that's not independent. An independent tester can be working within a sprint team, but they need to have some sort of of reporting path, whether it's to somebody who's officially titled as a test manager or somebody who's called a test coach or a quality coach or something. There needs to be a, a separate path where they can escalate problems if, if they're seeing problems without having to worry about censorship or self-censorship. Um, and again, I don't care what that person is called, but that, that needs to be there. And we've seen that with plenty of Agile teams, that they have that capability. Uh, let's see. Beverly says, uh, if the test team aligns to development team versus standalone, will there be any impact on how testing is handled? For example, impact on the politics. Um, Lines of the so I think you're, you're talking about it is in parallel with um, well yes I mean reporting reporting structure certainly um, has uh, has an effect on on politics of course because the, the politics, part of what politics is about dealing with is uh, uh, power relationships, authority relationships, responsibility relationships, and so forth. So, yeah, if you change those, you change the, the dynamics um, of it. Um, so, yes, it, it will, and you have to just try to be, be aware of it and, and cognizant of it. Uh, let's see, Amit says, uh, there's no such thing as not enough information to test. There's information that will enable only less efficient testing, but I think that it's quite easy, quite easy to explain the impact on testing. Well, fair enough. And he continues, also about specification, in an underspecified environment, testers can usually go and ask questions. The PM might not provide a solid document with requirements or even a high-level description, but I've yet to see one that won't answer a question here and there or agree to talk for half an hour. That's true. Uh, but yeah, efficiency efficiency can be an issue, you know. And I mean, this is why you see in Agile, for example, things like acceptance test-driven development slash specification by example and behavior-driven development. It's an attempt to get from the various stakeholders an agreement about what is the software uh, supposed to do uh, prior to building it, prior to testing it. So, yeah, I mean, I agree, you can always test something, but if you're running a test and you don't have, you see a behavior, you're like, Psh, well, that, that could be right, that could be wrong. I mean, in some cases, it's clearly wrong. You know, I mean, if, if you run a test and the software displays an answer, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Okay, boom, I don't need a specification to tell me that's wrong. You know, accuracy issues are usually pretty easy to, to, to spot, especially if you have a reasonably good understanding of a test as a tester of the business domain that you're operating in. It gets much more challenging when you start looking at things like suitability, like is this actually solving the user's problem? Um, you know, does is the user going to find this a, a good way of solving the problem? Things like usability, is it, you know, is this easy to use or hard to use? You know, performance, reliability, these, uh, you know, this stuff gets squishy. And uh, having a back and forth dialogue that's going on while you're on the critical path for release is not always uh, ideal. <laughs> Let's put it that way. All right, cool. Um, more great questions. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so to close this session, uh, do remember we run these free webinar sessions once a month. Uh, again, every other 
session, at least for this year, we're going to try this out. Um, people like it, we'll keep doing it. Is the one one key idea, the 20 minute short hit, quick solution kind of thing. Um, I see you guys have been looking at this for a while. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Do check our website, rbcs-us.com, to sign up for our uh, free webinars. Uh, sign up for our free uh, newsletter. You'll get valuable discounts on consulting and training services and a every other month newsletter with a featured article on, on testing and quality and news about what we're up to. Uh, you can see that we are on uh, uh, Twitter in the various guises there and on Facebook and I'm also on LinkedIn and as I said on YouTube definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel because uh, um, you'll get these uh, um, various recorded webinars um, you get notification of them along with other stuff that gets posted out there some, some of which I find amusing it's and stuff that's meant to be funny but most of it's meant to be useful and we're now going to have a lot of these recorded one key idea things out there um, we do post links to the both current and previous recorded webinars, uh, so watch for those on social media. Check out the blog. The blog is back, rbcs-us.com slash blog. We offer all of these free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not-just-for-profit company. But please don't forget, please don't forget, we also need to keep the lights on, so make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. Concludes the webinar. Thanks for showing up, and I look forward to seeing you guys uh, next uh, time around at the inaugural uh, One Key Idea session. Thanks.